Um, what I will now do in the next uh, 45 minutes is I will give a little bit of an introduction into the scientific topics of the school and in the general topic of device physics for mostly perovskite solar cells, but it will be at the beginning relatively general and also be applicable to, to other types of solar cells. So um, there are essentially two things I want to um, discuss with you today. So um, the first one is the detailed balance model of an ideal solar cell. I will tell you a little bit about where it comes from and what the, the main losses are in an ideal solar cell, why it has eventually 33% and not 99% um, efficiency. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about key concepts in, in device physics, as I call it device physics basics. So essentially recombination transport and the band diagram. This will only be um, yeah, a non, non exhaustive uh, discussion of this topic because the whole school will, about, will be about this um, different aspects of these topics. So I'll give you a little bit of the, of the key terminology and introduce some of the concepts that you should be knowing uh, when listening to the other talks. Okay, so I'll start with the ideal solar cell. Um, so essentially the idea is that uh, we have a sun, yeah, the star that illuminates uh, the earth that has a substantially higher temperature than the surface temperature of the earth. So the sun is around about 5,800 Kelvin and um, the earth are around about 300 Kelvin. And this temperature difference is what allows us to um, use the concept of photovoltaics essentially, yeah? because the sun has a completely different um, thermal radiation spectrum than a body at 300 Kelvin. And, and that's what we somehow have to use if we want to use the concept of photovoltaics. And um, the detailed balance model of an, of an ideal solar cell is, is essentially based on, on just looking at the exchange of radiation between the sun and the solar cell without really looking into the solar cell and, and looking at what, what the solar cell is doing. But this would be an example of, of a PN junction, band diagram of a PN junction. So this is a diet and it could also be a solar cell. And if we assume this is, this is one example of a solar cell, then essentially there are a couple of steps that need to happen in order to um, convert the energy that is contained in a photon that you can see here into um, electrical energy that can, can be given to an external circuit, to some load in an external circuit. And, and that's then essentially um, defining the efficiency of our photoconversion process. So what essentially happens is when a photon could be absorbed, if the energy of the photon is higher than uh, some absorption threshold, um, which is essentially the band gap of the semiconductor used to absorb the light. And then an electron hole pair is created and that electron hole pair will rapidly lose its energy, it will thermalize, and then there will be an electron and a hole. And they have round about the energy of the band gap, maybe plus KT. Um, but this is unfortunately not the energy free energy that you can extract to actually do work in your circuit. Yeah? But the, the energy per extracted carrier eventually is uh, the elementary charge times the voltage at the point of operation. So ideally the maximum power point. So it's, it's this difference of these two dashed lines here, yeah? and which is substantially smaller than the band gap. And this is, uh, this is one of the key things that one needs to understand um, in order to, to understand how photovoltaics works. It's, it's this difference between um, the voltage and the band gap. Yeah? So the voltage at an operation point and the illumination and, and the band gap of the semiconductor. Um, and they're unfortunately not, not identical. And I'll go into this in a bit more detail uh, during the following slides. Okay, so how can we calculate the efficiency of um, an ideal solar cell. So it was um, 
there's, there's one model that's often called Shockley Kreiser model after the people who came up with it. You can also call it detailed balance model or thermodynamic um, efficiency limit of a solar cell. And it essentially consists of two parts. So the first part is to take the sun and look at what the sun does. And the second part is look at the solar cell and see what the solar cell does and, and emits. And it's always based on looking at exchange of radiation. And um, if we start with the, the sun, yeah, so the sun is emitting a spectrum that is not, yeah, it's relatively similar to the black body spectrum of a body with a temperature of say 5,760 Kelvin. Yeah, this is what you can see in uh, this um, cyan or dark green line is such a black body spectrum. Um, here, this is the photo flux per area, time and energy and energy interval. That's the photon energy here. And you have to understand that this uh, green line is already um, the spectrum of a body of that temperature if it's as far away, if the sun is far away. Uh, so it only, you only see it under a very tiny angle and, and you're very far away from it. Uh, um, and, and so the, the power density that arrives at, on Earth is around one kilowatt per square meter. And you also lose a little bit because the atmosphere of the Earth absorbs some of the photons. Yeah? So essentially what you get is, the, is the, the red curve here. And if you then say, okay, I, I have a semiconductor with a band gap of say one electron volt in this example, then the ideal thing that that a solar cell could do is it could absorb all the photons that are in, in red here. Yeah? So everything from one electron volt onwards. And um, then if you were to integrate up that area and multiply it with the elementary charge, then that's the maximum photo current you could possibly have. Yeah? So this is the, yeah, this is the easy part of, of this detailed balance model. Um, and now we have to think about what the solar cell does. And the solar cell, we could also say, okay, the solar cell is also emitting thermal radiation. It's not emitting black body radiation because it isn't a black body, but um, it's, it's black body radiation from its band gap onwards. Yeah? And so one thing you could do is you could say, okay, this solar cell is exchanging radiation with the environment, which is also at 300 Kelvin. Um, and this radiation flux is essentially the emissivity of the solar cell times the black body spectrum of that solar cell at the temperature of 300 Kelvin. And um, because of Kirchhoff's law, we know that the emissivity of a body is equal to its absorptance, which means um, if the absorptance is zero below the band gap and say one above the band gap, then um, you would essentially emit the black body spectrum from the, from the band gap onwards yeah? and nothing, nothing below the band gap. And if you then integrate that up like we did before with the uh, photocurrent and add an elementary charge here, then we get something like the, the um, like a current that represents the current that needs to flow uh, in order to create a flux of photons that are constantly absorbed and emitted by the solar cell if it's in the dark. Yeah? So this current is not actually flowing because there's an equal amount of photons being absorbed and emitted if the solar cell is kept in the dark. Um, but but you, it's, a, it's a quantity that you can calculate. And if you calculate it, um, you could then call it the saturation current density in, in this detailed balance limit of, of a solar cell. And um, if, if we look at, what we need to, to ensure in order to have this exchange of radiation with the environment, then essentially what we need is, is radiative recombination. So uh, photons, which is thermal radiation from the environment are absorbed, create electrons and holes, and the electrons and holes are recombining and then create a photon flux like that. And this is a process that if, you, if the solar cell is in the dark, zero volt is, is constantly happening and, and keeps the concentration of electrons and holes at a certain density. Yeah? So depending on your doping density, you can have more electrons or more holes. 
that can change, but the product of electrons and holes in this um, equilibrium situation is always the same. It's called Ni square, yeah, the intrinsic carrier concentration square. Um, and this is, you would say, okay, this is not very interesting. Why do I care for solar cell in the dark? Um, the, the key reason why it's interesting is because from this dark situation, you can extrapolate towards a, a non-equilibrium situation uh, where you have extra charge carriers, extra electrons and holes that uh, you've created by illuminating the solar cell or by applying a, a voltage to the solar cell. And um, in this case, you have more electrons and more holes than before. And now the key thing is that you can calculate that and not derive it. You have to trust me on that for the moment. Is that the the extra concentration or the or the product of electrons and holes in this non-equilibrium situation is just the one in the equilibrium situation times this term exponent of elementary charge times voltage over Boltzmann constant times temperature, with the voltage being the distance between these two dashed lines, which are called the Quasi Fermi levels. Yeah? These dashed lines, they, they tell you how many electrons and holes you have. So this distance here, um, the exp exponent of this distance relates to the electron and hole concentration. And eventually also um, the distance between the quasi Fermi levels, if we look here and here, so distance between the Fermi level in, in the two contexts is then giving you eventually your voltage. So if this is all constant throughout your solar cell, then you have this QV everywhere in your solar cell. And that, that's essentially the idea of this detailed balance model to keep all these dashed lines uh, flat throughout. Okay. And then you have essentially exponent QV over KT more electrons times holes. And that also means because you need one electron, one hole, you have that many more photons coming out. Yeah? So you can say, okay, if I have a voltage applied to my system, then the amount of photons coming out must be this, yeah? the ones in equilibrium times exponent QV over KT. And this is now giving us our diet characteristic. Yeah? So this is where in this uh, detailed balance model, the exponential voltage dependence of, of a diet comes from. Yeah? So I, I try to illustrate this here with, with this graph. So we have again, photon flux versus energy, but this is now a logarithmic scale before we had a linear scale. You can still see the AM 1.5 spectrum in red here. Yeah, it now looks very flat because it's this logarithmic scale and there's not much happening here except for these big dips. Um, and what you can see here in black, this is the 300 Kelvin spectrum um, of, yeah, of a body at 300, black body at 300 Kelvin. And if we still keep our band gap at one electron volt, then this blue rectangle is what is in constantly absorbed and emitted if the solar cell is in the dark and exchanging thermal radiation with its environment. Yeah? And this is not very much. Yeah? So it's say 10 to the six photons per uh, square centimeter in second and electron volt, something on, on that level. Yeah? So that's very little. But now if, if there's a voltage applied to our system, then we have extra electrons and holes, um, then the whole thing looks uh, completely different. And we have this, for instance, this green rectangle at a certain voltage. And the, this, this green um, or triangle, sorry, not rectangle, this green triangle is now the emission that we have at open circuit. So this area here is exactly equal to, um, to the red area that you have coming from the AM1.5 spectrum. So that's the situation when there are as many photons coming from the sun uh, being absorbed by the solar cell as there are photons um, being emitted. The only thing that's different is the energy. Yeah? So here this is a this is white light coming from the sun and this is not perfectly monochromatic but a relatively small energy interval just above the band gap where this emission happens. Yeah? But in terms of photons um, per time and area it's th it's the same. Okay, and so this means we can now write down the uh, total equation. Yeah? So we have a current in the dark, which comes from this emission of photons times exponent QV over KT minus one is from the 
um, the absorption from the environment gives you the minus one. And then we have um, minus what comes from the sun, uh, minus short circuit current density. So essentially three terms. Uh, and, and this is everything that we need to, to define a current voltage curve in this shockley quasar model. Um, and then we get an efficiency that is unfortunately not 99%, uh, as I said before. So I want to discuss a little bit um, where the losses are coming from in this model. So what you can see here is uh, yeah, a graph that has photon energy on this axis and photon flux goes, goes downwards. That's a very strange thing now. And this um, line here gives you how many uh, photons you would have absorbed from um, zero towards whatever energy is here. Uh, so that means essentially, if you if you set your band gap um, to some value, like say one electron volt, then this is this value here, this distance here gives you how many photons you could um, use for your photocurrent if you absorb from one electron volt towards infinity. Uh, so essentially it will then later give you the maximum short circuit current density. So this axis will later become um, a current density axis and, and this axis will later become a voltage axis and then makes, makes more sense hopefully. And the area here, um, this, is, this is the power that is contained in, in this spectrum. Yeah? So this is the, the maximum power you could use um, in an ideal scenario. Um, if you could do magic essentially. Yeah, but for a solar cell, we'll have some intrinsic losses. So um, first loss is very obvious that if our band gap is here, then we just don't absorb part of the photons. Yeah? So the band gap here is at one, chosen at 1.6 electron volts now, which is kind of typical for perovskites. And, and all the yellow area is the power that you can't use because you can't even absorb it. Yeah? Now, the red part, this is all the power that you lose because you have um, photons with an energy that is much more than 1.6 electron volts. Yeah? And then they lose their energy by thermalization. Yeah? So this, this process of thermalization makes you lose, doesn't make you lose photons or electron hole pairs. The number stays the same, but the maximum energy um, of them after thermalization is just a band gap. So you cut off this extra energy that is above the band gap. And so you essentially are left over with this thing. So it's essentially band gap times, times the number of photons, which is this green triangle. Okay, and now um, the question is, how do you convert that? Um, you, can, you can think about um, converting that with your diet. And then let's have a look at different operating points. Now, first have a look at short circuit. Yeah? So at, at short circuit, there is current flowing out of your solar cell. So electrons are flowing out here, holes are flowing out here. But eventually there is no power delivered to the external circuit because the voltage is zero. Yeah. Um, so what is happening? Where is the energy going? I mean, in the shockley kreiser model, the detailed balance model, the electrons and holes are assumed to have an infinite mobility. Yeah. So they, they can't just dissipate energy inside their solar cell because their scattering is, is, uh, takes forever. Yeah? Um, so they're kind of infinitely fast. And then the only thing that, that they can do is they can essentially uh, dissipate their energy in the contact. Yeah? So they'll just go here into the contact. And then the only thing that can happen is they must thermalize inside the contact. Yeah? So the only thing that you do at short circuit is you kind of, in that model, you heat up the contact. In reality, you heat up your solar cell as well because you're, Mobility is not infinitely high. Yeah. Okay. Now at open circuit, you also don't deliver any power to your external circuit because no current is flowing. Yeah. What happens at open circuit is that you illuminate your solar cell, you create electrons and holes, and the electrons and holes then recombine and emit photons. It's what we've, we've seen before. And so the whole green area is essentially emission of photons back towards yeah, the environment, a little bit goes back towards the sun. Most of it goes back into the hemisphere above the solar cell. So everything is, um, is essentially lost by radiative recombination. And now only 
at this maximum power point, so somewhere here on our current voltage curve, there we will actually generate or actually deliver power to the external circuit, which is this white area here. Yeah? And then we must have a splitting of these quasi-family levels. So there must be a finite voltage and there's also finite current flowing. So in this case, this would be the maximum power point. At the maximum power point, there's a little bit of recombination happening. Yeah? So this green triangle is this uh, recombination flux times the band gap is the energy of the photons that is emitted. Um, and most of it is still dissipated by heating up the contact. And this is this, this blue rectangle here. Okay. And, and now you can see, okay, now uh, we have a voltage axis and a current density axis here. And, and this is now, this white thing is now what you can use. Uh, and this is in the ideal scenario, this is about 33% of the total um, power. And you can also see where the losses are, are going, mostly in not absorbed, some in thermalized and some in heating up the contact and a very tiny bit in, in uh, luminescence of, of photons leaving the solar cell. Okay. Um, so depending on your band gap, you can have, um, I mean, these, these losses can change depending on the band gap. You know? So if you move your band gap down, um, you will have less of the yellow area. So this is what you can see here. These are current voltage curves uh, for different band gaps. For low band gaps, you get more, more photocurrent, but less open circuit voltage. And for higher band gaps, like here, you get less photocurrent, but more open circuit voltage. The key question is what is the ideal band gap that you can only see that when you, uh, instead of plotting the current density versus voltage, plot the power density versus voltage. You mean, that means you multiply current times voltage uh, with a minus in this case, so we have a positive uh, quantity. And now you can see the black one, the low band gap is worse here than the red one. And the blue one is the worst of all of them. So the red one seems to be the best here best compromise between um, between generating photocurrent and photovoltage and gives you the highest power density at this point here at the, this maximum power point. So in this case it's about 33 milliwatt per square centimeter and because from the sun we get 100 milliwatt per square centimeter um, the uh, AM1.5 spectrum this is then giving us the efficiency. Yeah? So you divide the 33 milliwatt per square centimeter by 100 milliwatt per square centimeter, and then this would be the efficiency of 33%, which is the best you can get. Um, here you can see um, how the losses are distributed over the voltage. If you have such a plot of power density versus voltage, you can see here, this is the maximum power point. You can see the blue one is the loss due to heating up the contacts that are explained, and the green one is the loss due to photon emission. Um, the photon emission loss gets bigger towards open circuit, yeah, and the collection loss gets bigger towards short circuit. And thermalization and transmission, they're independent of voltage. They always um, happen independent of what the operating point of your solar cell is. Okay, and then eventually you get this uh, figure here, which is um, efficiency versus band gap energy. You can see here, this, this is the 33% range here, um, which you can reach between say 1.1 and 1.4 and a bit electron volt. And um, most of the band gaps relevant for perovskites, most of the perovskites are somewhere here in the, in the 30% region. Yeah. You can also, um, yeah, sorry. You can also do um, an analysis of the losses here, and then you can see, okay, um, if you go to higher band gaps, then the yellow area, then the loss due to transmission gets bigger, and if you go to lower band gaps, the thermalization loss gets bigger. Yeah. This is essentially, yeah, relatively simple concept of where's the band gap and what do I absorb and what do I not absorb. Okay, um, you can also extend that to multi-junction solar cells. I'm not going into too much detail, but if, if you use 
two absorbers on top of each other, you can get indeed also higher efficiencies. So for instance, here you can see there's a, there's a 45% efficient region if you combine say one electron volt band gap of a lower band gap cell with say 1.6 or 6 and 6.5 um, electron volt for a higher band gap solar cell. So this this does work and it's a very important topic also for periscites um, to look into multi-junction solar cells. Okay, now this is um, record efficiency versus time for actual solar cells. And you can see, okay, this is the 33% thermodynamic limit. Um, periscites are 25 and a bit. Yeah, and I think now it's 25.5. Um, and silicon is a little bit better still, um, but th there's still some distance to the thermodynamic limit. So an, an obvious question is therefore, um, what are the key key losses in in real world solar cells? And this is what um, what most of photovoltaic research is about. Yeah, to try to look at these losses that. Um, make a real solar cell be slightly worse than an ideal solar cell in the thermodynamic limit. And um, one of the key things, you know, you have optical losses, of course, yeah, that your absorptance is, is maybe not a step function, but um, more smeared out, you can have reflection losses. Um, you can have parasitic absorption in in contact layers, yeah. So if you have an ITO or electron hole transport layer, they can also absorb light, but they will probably not create electron hole pairs that will can be collected. Um, can have problems because your cell heats up and is not at 300 Kelvin. That can also lead to a loss in, in practice. Um, but then there are two key losses here that are due to extra recombination and um, non-selective. Uh, contacts. And, and this is kind of, these are the, I would say, the key topics for um, the field of device physics and also the, yeah, the key topics for our school. Yeah? It's, it's mostly about the electric, electronic losses that can occur. And in the remaining time, I want to talk a little bit about these losses. And I will mostly use just one slide for this, the one that comes in a moment. Um, and that slide looks absolutely terrible. Um, you'll see in a moment, but I'll explain it very, very slowly. So um, what is device physics? Yeah? So for me, the topic of device physics for solar, I think everybody can have their own interpretation of it. But for me, it's kind of to generate an understanding of how to go from material parameters to device performance and to have the characterization methods to, to know that. Yeah? And in a way, there are some material parameters that you have to live with, if you have, a, well, at least to a certain degree, you have to live with them. Yeah? So for instance, absorption coefficient of the material. Yeah, I mean, if the absorption coefficient of silicon is just the absorption coefficient of silicon, to a certain degree, you have to live with that, Yeah, if you want to make a silicon solar cell. Yeah? And, also the mobility of silicon you have to live with. The lifetime of silicon, if, I mean, yeah, that, that you can improve. I mean, if you already have um, a perfect float zone wafer, then you will probably also have to live with the lifetime. But this is, this is uh, something, especially in new materials like periscites that you have, can, can work on. Yeah? And then you have the intrinsic carrier concentration, which is related to the effective density of states. And mostly you also have to live with that and the band gap, which you can often tune a bit by changing stoichiometries. Yeah. In silicon, you have to live with the band gap, but in the periscites, you can change it a bit. And then there are parameters you can affect um, quite explicitly, like thickness, for instance, thickness of your material you can change. Yeah? The doping density, you can, in some materials, you can change it quite well, in others, not so much. And for instance, the built-in voltage work function of your contacts, that's also something you may be able to adjust separately from, from your absorber material. And then if you, if you know all these things, uh, would you then be able to say how to go from there to, to the current voltage curve? 
Um, you don't have to answer this, um, but this is a rhetorical question. And if, if you finish with the school, or even if you finish um, this in the next 15 minutes, you should, should know how to go from here to a current voltage curve. And if you go through the school, you should also know or have an idea of how to get to at least some of these parameters and what they mean. So essentially for me at the beginning was that when I was a PhD student, I didn't really have a clear understanding of how to go from here to here. And then, um, yeah, you can start looking it up and then you get two equations and then, then at, at that point it gets terrible. Yeah, because then you, you, you get to read maybe a little bit about um, device modeling and how you calculate these things. And then you end up with, even in the simplest version with these three differential equations. And then you say, ah, no, maybe, maybe not my topic. Yeah? And so if you give me 10 minutes, I want to, want to bring that a little bit to you so that it doesn't sound too terrible. Yeah? So essentially, um, what we have to go from here to here is uh, these two continuity equations for electrons and holes. They always start with a dn dt, so a change in electron concentration or a change in hole concentration is given by a couple of terms, which I'll, I'll explain to you in a moment. Yeah? So um, this tells you about something about electron hole concentration, and this tells us something about the about phi, which is the electrostatic potential. Uh, so this brings in, essentially brings in Maxwell's, yeah, one of Maxwell's equations, the one um, that connects the electric field with the space charge. Uh, and the electric field is then related to the electrostatic potential. And these three equations, they're unfortunately coupled, so they depend on each other. And understanding them is the key to understanding device physics. And then maybe in the periscopes, you have to understand a little bit more. You have to understand what the boundary conditions are for these equations. And you have to understand what, what ions can do that, that changes the whole picture a little bit. But let's, let's just, just start with, with this, um, these three equations. OK, so. One of the first things you can see is they have this G here. Yeah? G is the generation rate. Um, so it tells you how many electrons and holes are created per time interval. So this is about the optics. This is about your absorption coefficient, about the thickness of your material, and whether you have uh, some light trapping or anti-reflective coating. That, that will all affect your generation rate. Yeah? Um, then you have a minus R, which always means, okay, you can also lose uh, charge carriers due to recombination. Um, and, th and that's, that's um, much more the topic of, of this school. So this is about the electronic properties of your device. So let me just illustrate that with a band diagram. So one of the two key mechanisms that you have to lose electrons and holes is either they recombine and emit a photon, which is kind of the inverse process of how they were created, or the electron and hole recombine and create heat in one way or another. One way of creating heat would be by um, going towards a localized intermediate state, which might be a point defect in your material. Um, and by going from here to this, localized state, they create lots of phonons. Yeah? So they dissipate their energy by making the crystal move a little bit faster. Yeah? And um, so it's not one phonon that you need for a transition. It's many, many, many. Yeah? So like 50 or so yeah? in, in perovskites. So the phonon energy is pretty tiny. Um, and depending on which kind of mechanism is dominating, you'll have a different dependence on electron and hole concentration. So radiative recombinations will scale with the product of electron and hole concentration like we had before, um, and then scale with the exponent of Fermi level splitting over KT. Well, um, this recombination here um, scales with this uh, rational function that has an N and P in the numerator and then an N, essentially an N plus P in the denominator. So it's a bit different and can, can therefore lead to also different effects in your, um, in, in things that you measure 
Like it will change the way how the open circuit voltage depends on light intensity, for instance. Uh, it will also change the way how a photoluminescence transient will look like if, if this dominates. Uh, so this is a very important topic that we'll, um, that we'll see again in, in many different talks later this week. Okay, um, and then you have uh, these two terms for electrons and holes. And this is essentially the spatial derivative of the diffusion current. So this is about charge transport. And this depends mostly on mobility. Yeah? The dn and dp are the diffusion uh, constants and they're related linearly proportional to mobility and to this thermal voltage here. And then the last one here is the, um, the drift current, or the derivative of the drift current which depends on mobility, on charge carrier density, and on the electric field, which I call F here, to not confuse it with the energy E that I have on the other slides. Okay, and then finally, we have this um, Poisson equation here, which relates the second derivative of the electrostatic potential to um, the space charge and the permittivity. Yeah? This, the space charge is, um, is affected mostly by the concentrations of free carriers and of dopants, uh, so ionized dopants. So you have um, the holes and the ionized uh, donor atoms, they have positive charge, and the electrons and the ionized acceptor atoms, they have a ne <coughs> negative charge. And so depending on where you are in your device, you may have different um, concentrations. Okay, um, and then we have, um, yeah, we have the problem that all these equations are coupled. So we have the uh, electrostatic potential here that, that goes into transport because we have the electric field piece here. Yeah, and the derivative of the electrostatic potential is the electric field. Um, we have the recombination that goes in here and that depends on carrier density. Um, and it also depends like the recombination term here depends also on the hole density and, and the one here depends on the electron density. Um, and then we have the space charge where the, again, the concentration of electrons and holes also go in here. So, so each of the um, equations has terms in it that are also in some of the other equations. So it's all kind of a, problem that builds upon each other. Um, and then there's one more question that you could ask. So at, at some point, differential equations also need to have boundary conditions. And so there are, there are different places in, in a device where that would matter. So it would matter at the very end. So for instance, here, you know, have the contact to, um, to the cathode or the contact to the anode, but also at interfaces, you can have extra terms like interface recombination, for instance, sorry, um, that goes very similar to bulk recombination, but it does have um, this parameter S, P and S, N in it, which are surface recombination velocities that uh, you'll later also hear more about in, in other talks. Okay, then one more thing that I was, I was asked to introduce um, is, is the concept of um, Fermi levels, quasi-Fermi levels. So this is an illustration where you can see current voltage curve. Yeah? And then for the key working point, short circuit, maximum power point, and open circuit, you have different, um, different shapes of the band diagram and different Fermi levels. Yeah? So here, everything is pretty flat at open circuit, and here it kind of has a gradient. And, is just one more thing that I want to mention. If you look at these gradients here, yeah, um, that you can see, why do we have these gradients at short circuit? They, they come from the fact that at short circuit, there's lots of current flowing out of the device. And this, if you want to drive a current out, and there's this equation that says the current is related to um, mobility and electron or hole density, and then the gradient of the quasi Fermi level. So that means in order to drive out current, um, here you need, if the carrier density is not too high, which it usually isn't at short circuit, you need to 
have a substantial gradient to drive out the current. Yeah? If you look at open circuit, it's very different. Here, the Fermi levels are flat, yeah? and that is because there is no current going out of your device. Yeah? And here, at short circuit, there's a substantial current flowing, which means there's also a gradient. And at the maximum power point, there's only a tiny gradient because there are many more charge carriers, so N and P are pretty big. Then for the same current to flow out, you need much less of a gradient. And this is important to understand if you want to understand um, what band diagrams are telling you. OK, now time's up for the um, scientific introduction. Now I will just briefly uh, finish by introducing the speakers and the topics. So um, the next scientific talk will be given by Piers Bars from Imperial College. This will be mostly about how to interpret trends in the frequency domain methods um, when you have uh, ions included. Uh, so how, how do you include uh, and consider the effect of ionic charge if you want to understand these methods? Um, and then we asked each of the speakers to provide us with questions um, that you should have received. And you can hand answers to these questions in. So it's kind of always a, it's either yes, no questions or different, different options that can be uh, true or wrong. Um, and this is the question that, that Piers provided. So it's about um, how voltage change if you, or current changes if you, if you do something to a cell. So I think you have to, have to draw it after the talk and see whether it makes sense. Yeah. I'll not read out the, um, questions so we, we don't run too much over time. Um, second talk will be by Philip Schulz about surface and interface analysis. So there you should learn how photoelectron spectroscopy works and how that relates to the energy levels that you have at interfaces. Uh, and these are the, the questions. So it's about UPS and XPS mostly and about determining ionization energies. Okay, then on Thursday, the first talk will be by Uwe Rau about selective contact, so how to transform chemical energy, so quasi Fermi level splitting, into electrical potential, so means the dif difference, voltage difference between the two contacts and uh, how to do that well and how not to do that well. And yeah, he's got these questions which you have to read, and you have to read them carefully, it's a lot of text. Um, Okay, then Susanne is talking about uh, photoluminescence. And um, she's got a couple of questions on, or one question, a couple of possible answers on how to achieve a high quasi Fermi level splitting at a given excitation and what helps to get there. Then we have Thomas Unold from Helmholtz Center Berlin. He will talk about what can go, yeah, essentially what can go wrong in in typical characterization techniques of photovoltaic materials and, and solar cells. We call it basic checks for consistency. Um, and he's got a couple of questions where you have to think whether you can actually measure or find out whether that's a, it's a valid measurement. Uh, so if you have a certain thickness of a perovskite, would you be able to determine a certain doping density, for instance? Then Lynn, she'll give the first talk on Friday about a density functional theory. So the talk is called Optoelectronic Properties of Halide Perovskites from First Principles Numerical Modeling. Um, and she's got some questions on, on, on the DFT calculation of your ionization potential and um, whether they're they are true or not. Yeah. So can you extract the ionization potential from this? And the last one um, will be given by David Kahn, and it's about defects in halide perovskites. It has the interesting subtitle, tautology, oxymoron, or what? I currently don't know what that exactly means. We'll have to listen to him. And um, the question here already gives some information on what it's gonna be about. So he asks about assumptions or laws that are valid in defect chemical descriptions of crystalline solids. And, um, then he lists a few and then you can think whether, or after the talk, you can, can check whether you understood which of these uh, are assumptions are used 